Good afternoon. This is Tom McGrath, editor of Philadelphia Magazine, and welcome to day two of Philadelphia Magazine's ThinkFest. Thanks for tuning into this conversation about the future of Philadelphia's wealth gap, featuring council member Maria Canones Sanchez and noted author and urbanist Richard Florida. Maria Canones Sanchez has been a member of city council since 2008, the first Latina ever elected to that body. In her time in office, among the issues she's focused on have been affordable housing, support for small business, and good government reform. Richard Florida is best known as the author of The Rise of the Creative Class and The New Urban Crisis. He's the first ever Philadelphia Fellow and last year issued a report about trying to develop inclusive prosperity in Philadelphia. Before we get to our conversation, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, including ThinkFest's presenting sponsor, Bank of America, as well as St. Joseph's University, T-Zero Group, and Paperboy Media Group. ThinkFest continues with conversations all this week at noon and 4 p.m. I hope you can join us for all of them. I also invite you to join us for a wellness event next month, Be Well Philly Fest. You can find more details at phillymag.com slash bewellphilly. One note about this conversation. It was recorded last Tuesday, June 2nd, after a weekend of unrest in Philadelphia. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the conversation. Our session today is going to be an exciting conversation. It's all about the future of Philadelphia's wealth gap. And we're honored to have two very prestigious guests with us today. Richard Florida, the noted author and academic and now uh, expert on Philadelphia. And council member Maria Canones Sanchez, who is a longtime city council member um, and lots of interest in the particular issues that we're going to be talking about today. I want to note for our audience that we're recording this conversation due to some scheduling challenges, and we're recording it on Tuesday, June 2nd. Um, so we're in the midst of uh, the unrest that has gripped Philadelphia and so many other cities around the country. Um, and obviously some of that is going to be part of our conversation today. So actually, that's, I think, a good place to start this conversation. So at least nominally, the protests that we're seeing in Philadelphia and around the country um, are about police brutality um, and, and issues around policing, but, but clearly there's, there's other issues involved here as well, some of which I think pertain to wealth. So I'm curious, and Richard, let me start with you, how much you think economic issues are also playing into the, into the unrest that we're seeing at the moment? Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Counselor. And uh, my heart goes out to the great city of Philadelphia. Um, folks should know that the reason I became an urbanist is I'm from Newark, New Jersey. And viewing the Newark riots, what we used to call the riots, um, civic unrest in the late 1960s as a little boy and seeing tanks in the streets of my hometown really is what made me an urbanist. So this uh, weighs heavy on my heart and my mind. Um, I got to know Philadelphia because I was named the inaugural Philadelphia Fellow. That's something that John Fry at Drexel, the folks at Thomas Jefferson and the University Science Center teamed on. And that work was on how to build a more inclusive uh, Philadelphia, building off my earlier research on what I called the new urban crisis. And what I came to learn uh, was Philadelphia, like so many of our great cities, had witnessed an urban revival. Uh, its downtown had come back and was kind of a shining city on the hill, if you will. Uh, but it was a tale of two Philadelphias, and woefully so. Um, outside of the pockets of gentrification and upgrading around the downtown core and around the university district, our vast loss of poverty, which you all know better than me, uh, I think we documented that anywhere from a quarter, a fifth to a quarter of Philadelphia households live in dire poverty. And really, uh, the, the pockets of opportunity were walled off from others. We, we said it was a small area of concentrated advantage ringed by much larger spans of concentrated disadvantage and urged the city and its business leadership, its anchor institutions to take that into account, to provide better jobs for frontline workers and to address the problem of concentrated poverty. You know, I, I don't think I could have ever anticipated that given the COVID crisis and the lockdown and simmering political and civic unrest, uh, and we know that police brutality has caused almost every riot before, would cause a literally a national state of unrest because people are deploring these conditions which can't continue. So yeah, it's deep-seated economic class and racial issues and deep-seated divides that have precipitated this. Council member, what, what are you seeing as, in, as, you're, as you're watching these protests take place and also talking to people in your own community? Well, I think to Richard's point, there's some deep-rooted issues around disparity that the pandemic highlighted for folks 
amplified it in a life and death situation. And what we see um, in the protesters, right, because I want to separate the protesters from the looters and the other folks instigating, taking advantage of the situation. In the protesters, there's an anger and they want to be heard. Um, and I think that what, what we have seen is that the displacement, all of the rhetoric, as much as the city says it wants to be inclusive, our policies are hostile against poor people from access to their own benefits, federal benefits that we're entitled to, to access to adequate housing. Um, it's hostile. And what, you, what has been reflected um, is that anger coming back out. Now, what does that mean? post this because the conversation is, have we really heard people? And then how do we change the policy from our abatement strategy to our investment strategy? When we invested in the center city core, we were very clear that we were incentivizing and investing. When money and advocacy is done for neighborhoods, it's considered an expense. And the budgets always reflect that. And until we change that, people have a right to be frustrated. Um, and we're going to see more of this. Richard, in your report, you made some, some pretty concrete recommendations or at least areas of focus that you thought the city of Philadelphia and the citizens of Philadelphia needed to focus on. I wonder if you could just sort of talk about some of the key ones that, that you came up with in, in your report. Sure. But let me just, let me echo what the councilwoman said. I mean, according to our data, um, the COVID crisis, and not just our data, all the maps and analysis we've seen, the COVID crisis is hitting so much harder at Black and Latino people in Philadelphia. In Michigan, 40% of the people who died are African Americans who represent 14% of the population. In the Mission District, the study that was done in the Mission District in San Francisco, where they sampled 3,000 residents in a very diverse community of professional workers, knowledge workers, homeless people, 90% of the Pace, the people who are positive were frontline workers. I mean, that means less than 10% of us were people like us who could work remotely. And more than 90% were Hispanic and African American. So I think this highlights, you know, um, of course, older people are vulnerable, but poor people. I mean, this, this highlights an underlying disease, which is poverty, uh, which is just so tragic. Yeah, we, we, we really challenged the anchor institutions to step up, and, and they were the ones who funded us. And, and we kind of said in that report, uh, universities, particularly, have played such a great role in Philadelphia's comeback. And, you know, in, in areas of, of Western Philly, parts of area of West Philly, and parts of areas around the university district, they did engage the community, and they did provide programs that extended to the community. But they were not sufficient. They were definitely not sufficient. And we urged the anchors to, to come up. So we said, uh, develop strategies to upgrade service workers. You can do it. And we urge the mayor to do the same thing, provide a living wage. And now our frontline workers are telling us that, that we need a, front, a living wage. In factories across this country, they're saying, if you don't pay us a living wage and protect us, the factories will go down. And we urge the strategy that bridged economic and community development, where exactly as the councilwoman said, it's not just about investing in certain economically important areas. Of course, you want a thriving downtown, but it's building up our communities. And I think that's you know, it's never hit me like it has now, because I thought of it from an equity point of view and then an economics point of view, but not from a community health point of view and resiliency. If we don't upgrade those communities and invest in their residents, their health declines and all of our health declines. So I guess what we would called for, if we rephrased it, is not only an inclusive Philadelphia, but a just and resilient Philadelphia. And you know, hopefully, hopefully these steps can be taken in the wake of this crisis. Hopefully we will uh, join this mission to make our cities more inclusive, more just, and more re resilient. Yeah, it feels like one of the things that COVID has exposed is, is not just the way, you know, a sort of quality of life issues in Philadelphia, but literally these are matters of life and death. Um, and I think that's one of the things that has become clear from, from the last two or, two or three months that, as we've gone through this. Councilmember, I'm curious what, what you think the areas of focus need to be, you know, specifically as we, as we move forward here to try and really make some change around some of these issues. 
So I spent the last year at the request, council put together a report in March of 2019. It was called Narrowing the Gap in Response to Pew and some of the other studies. And so I spent the last year facilitating a lot of conversations with like 100 subject experts from all walks of life. Um, and we broke down into safe, you know, social safety net. We looked at jobs and education and, and, and training. Um, and, and we looked at housing. And we came up with some strategies and to to Richard's point, we really had conversations with you know Fry and others, and said we really need to be committed to getting off this poverty list. Right? What is your what is the what is your motivator? Is it getting off the list? Is it you know because you love Philadelphia, and we're very lucky. We have big institutions, you know, whether it's IBC and others who who love Philadelphia, Comcast with, with all of its challenges. And so what we did is we put forth an action plan um, in March and really were prepared, um, had set aside $25 million to create, like some of the other cities are doing, a, pu a public-private partnership. Folks just don't want to give the city money. They want to see their money invested. They want to see outcomes they want to see return on investments and we did a whole a whole list of strategies that i believe now we have to double down on right and so what the mayor does when he revises his budget he takes out some of the things we talked about around the deep poverty and poverty and it's like no this is when you double down on the types of investment because the folks who are poor and and generational poverty they're resilient the new poor after COVID, they're losing their minds. They have no idea that you have to apply for unemployment and you have to go. The stories I hear now, and it, you know, I take every opportunity to say, this is what we've created. When we have a system of the folks who, who live in poverty and the structural kind of poverty, generational poverty, this is what they live through every single day. And so I hope the conversation, especially in the last couple of days when we've started to talk about the has the economic injustice, the racial issues, that we have a real honest conversation and meet people where they are and listen to folks, but then really commit to it. But Again, if the policies of the city are going to be hostile towards these folks, then this is what you're going to get. You're just going to get anger. And anger has to be channeled into action. And, and in council, I hope that we will not accept the mayor's budget um, as proposed and that we double down on our commitment into the subject experts who worked for us and worked with us around this poverty plan. Institutions are ready to step up to the plate, but they want something different. They don't want the, the, the same rhetoric and they want accountability, right? And they want evaluation to what we're doing. So, so to build on that, I think we've been coming from behind the eight ball in this whole COVID crisis. And that's not just in Philadelphia. Uh, back in March, people talked about expanding healthcare capacity, which was critical, and getting economic and financial assistance out to small business workers, arts and cultural economy. At that point, I wrote a report for Brookings saying, economic developers, chambers of commerce, not frontline health workers, mm -hmm. not our hospital people, uh, need to get together on a reopening plan. They need to begin to think about how to reopen those civic assets, how to put people in, how to provide not only financial assistance, but technical assistance to small neighborhood businesses, how to provide technical assistance to arts and creative organizations so they can reopen with the uh, um, appropriate physical distancing and protective equipment, how the transit systems and airports and big uh, civic assets, no one paid attention. We wrote a report for Brookings in, in late March. I think now is the time for Philadelphia and other cities to think about a long-term recovery plan. I mean, this is like a natural disaster hitting the nation on steroids. And when we have natural disasters like earthquakes or, or hurricanes, we have recovery plans. And I think that's what we need here is a recovery plan. And, and you know, people say a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We've actually wasted three crises. Mm -hmm. In the wake of 9-11, people said uh, our cities will be hard hit. Uh, they're going to have trouble people are going to move to the suburbs. Of course, that didn't happen. Our cities came back. In the wake of the economic crisis of 2008, people said the same thing. Our cities are going to be hard hit. I actually wrote a piece for The Atlantic, a cover story where I said we have the opportunity for a reset in cities that we could target inclusion and affordability. Well, that window closed and gentrification occurred again. If we waste a third crisis, that's unconscionable. 
And so we need a recovery plan, a comprehensive recovery plan, just like the counselor said, with investments in all of the elements, frontline workers, impacted poverty communities, old poor, and newer poor, concentrated, dis concentratedly distressed neighborhoods to lift all boats. And, and we've got to do it now because we can't wait. I mean, they, you know, the recovery is going to happen. And if we don't do this, you know, one scenario, I, I hope this isn't the case, is we move to even a more gilded and gated city, right? Where, the, where barricades, if you will, physical and otherwise, go up around certain neighborhoods. So really the opportunity now or the, or the obligation is to build an economic recovery plan two, three, five years out, how we can have a more just, inclusive, and resilient city going forward. You know, one of the challenges that Philadelphia has long faced, I think, is the way, is the way power and influence is sort of siloed here. There is political power over here. There's business power over there. There's academic or nonprofit power somewhere else. So I, I guess the question for both of you, and, and Council Member, I'd start with you on this, is who has to lead the charge on this? Or both who and, and how? How do, how do we get all of the areas of the city to be working on this in a, in a sort of unified, in a unified way. I think we, again, we had started to do that when we started to talk about the public private partnership. And again, when I talked and I went into rooms with, you know, the philanthropic community um, and I reached out to some of the presidents of the universities and others, it's like this, ha they kept saying to me, Maria, this has to be different and there needs to be some political energy around it. Um, they, folks invest all the time and they they do things at the university level, but they want to be part of a winning team, right? I think there's, there, there was an energy, again, this was pre COVID and, the, and now they need to see the leadership behind it. We all need to say the economic vitality of the, si uh, of the city for everyone is important for everyone. And then we have to be very intentional about mixed messaging to folks, right? When you say to folks, we want to be, be inclusive, but the mayor's budget is, you know, we're holding police and fire harmless, but then we're uh, eliminating the housing trust fund, or we're uh, eliminating adult education, or we're eliminating the arts and cultural office. We can downsize, resize, reimagine, reframe, but when you eliminate, you say things are hopeless. So our messaging from government has been off. Um, but I think our business community, and even during COVID, you know, you had the small business fund, you had the COVID response fund, you had the COVID arts and culture, they came together and contributed. So, you know, I what I get from them is they want to see leadership um, from government that's really committed to it. When we send a budget that says it's just about taxes and we're eliminating sectors of our community that we value. I mean, who eliminates the arts and culture office when the economy of downtown is so much based on that, when tourism. So we got to move from crisis and part of moving to crisis, to, to recovery is that leadership role of when we're all going to be better. I have one of the most challenging districts and I have to be the cheerleader every single day because if people think, I think it's hopeless, the city thinks investing in neighborhoods is hopeless. So I go downtown every single day talking about the possibilities. Even with this post-COVID world, when you look at the restaurant uh, world, okay, you can't have a small cozy restaurant downtown, but you can have a spacious restaurant in Kensington in Norris <laughs> Square. So I think to, to Richard's point is, how do we look at this as full of opportunities to do a, re, a smart restart and a reset that is more equitable? But equitable doesn't happen if we don't acknowledge the institutional disparities that exist at our core. We have to own those, right, and check ourselves on them. So, so to build on that, I think it's everybody's responsibility I think it's the business community's responsibility. Um, I think it's the anchor institutions, the universities and medical centers. I think it's the political reality of both the city and the state and the federal delegations to come together around this. And I think it's residents and community leaders. One thing that I will say that I noticed in Philadelphia, um, well, two things. Uh, first, one challenge I saw is that the community development community was very skeptical of any effort that involved the elites. And I think that goes back to the councilwoman's statement that there's been a long history of institutional racism and neglect. But boy, oh boy, did I feel pushed back. And, and much of it rightly so. This isn't a solution. This is more of the big institutions talking at us, not talking with us. And no matter what I did to try to reassure, it, it, I felt it. And I felt it in a way I, 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 I feel it in a few other cities. Now on the positive, 
Uh, Philadelphia has very important institutions. If COVID is a medical crisis, you have some of the greatest medical institutions in the world. You have a vibrant arts and cultural sector, um, one that needs support, but is quite vibrant, especially for the size of the city. But moreover, your restaurant sector is undergirded by some of the strongest and most powerful players who define the restaurant scene in the nation. I mean, Stephen Starr is arguably the most important restaurateur in New York City, never mind that he comes from Philadelphia. Um, but but I think, you know, it's going to take an organized effort. And, and here's why I'm a little bit upbeat. I don't want to sound like Pollyanna. People make the comparison now to 1967 and 1968. Philadelphia and my Newark and New York City and Detroit were very different cities in 1967, 1968. Business was pulling out. Department stores had already left. Com there was very few restaurants left in the inner city, never mind arts and culture. The city was being abandoned by a suburban shift. Now our cities are on the upswing. Business knows that they need the city. Arts and culture has thrived. Universities, I think very importantly, universities have realized, especially led by Philadelphia, that they can't gate themselves off. They have to embrace the community. So I see a very different game plan. And really the question going forward is, do more communities get included in Philadelphia's revival, which is I think the, the, the appropriate way to go, the morally just way to go, or does the revival stay one-sided? I, I don't think it will end. I don't think we'll see abandonment of the city. We just may see a more divided city. And I think it's all of our obligations, business community, political community, civic community, community development, poverty mitigation community to work together to make sure that the city becomes more of one Philadelphia instead of two. Richard, I think you raise a really interesting point about the skepticism among communities of, of anchor institutions and, and other sort of you know, places of power. Council member, I'm wondering, um, first of all, if you agree with that, but also if you do, what are things, how can we break down some of those walls and start to develop a bit more trust among people in Philadelphia? I think we're always pinning one group against the other. Even when we, when we talk about investments, right? When we talk about the housing trust fund and their advocates versus the arts and cultural fund and their advocates. I was on a Zoom meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and I said to them, I will advocate for the restaurant business, for, for, for all of the things the city can do. Can you advocate for the housing trust fund? Can you advocate, and, and, and they have in the past around education. Can it, the advocacy not just be your lane, but everyone's lane, right? So that we're not pitting the groups against each other, but we're saying we have to do this and we have to do that. It is so easy in the political little um, uh, circle that we operate in, that we call City Hall, to isolate yourself from the reality of these conversations. We can no longer do that. If we've learned anything with the incidents over this last weekend is we can't do that anymore, right? People took those walls down and in some places burned them up because that's how angry they were. And I think we can get there, but it's moving away from pinning groups against each other. Um, there, there are institutions and, and models of operating around, even around poverty that need to be re, re, readdressed, reframed, you know. You know, if we're spending uh, $30,000 in transitional housing for a family and it takes three years to move them to permanency, we can buy them a house. I mean, we really just need to change how we evaluate, how we help folks, how do we take people through this continuum of care. Even as we talk about healthcare, behavioral health, I'm in the middle of the opioid pandemic and we're, you know, it really is hard to move people. We say we want to pe meet people where they are, but we only want to, we want them to enter our systems the same way. And so the world has changed and government and some of the bigger institutions haven't evolved. But I think we can get there. People just want a plan. They want, and that's why we called our plan Poverty Action Plan. These are the strategies we want to invest. Are you willing to invest in these, in these strategies? But what we learned is it can't be government driven. It has to be a public-private partnerships. The stakeholders on the ground have to feel just as invested and just as valued. And when it's just coming from government, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked and it won't work. You know, we, we seem to have entered a new phase in urban America or, or maybe the ongoing revival of great cities. The first phase, um, and I wrote a book that got adopted by some of this. It wasn't the message of the book, but it's how the book got interpreted that many of these organizations, uh, less the universities, to some degree the urban universities, and, and certainly the business community said, 
The key to the urban revival is to attract talented and ambitious professional people back to city centers, the people who had left for the suburbs. So they, they went about attracting young people, the gay and lesbian community, empty nesters, uh, what I called, I'm making air quotes and making fun of myself, the creative class. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did that by providing quality of life amenities, uh, arts and culture in the city, better business opportunity, and of course the knowledge jobs came back. But it was a very uneven revival and more uneven than certainly I anticipated. And the revival happened much quicker than anyone would have uh, uh, estimated. Certainly, I would say my greatest error was that I completely underpredicted how fast and swift this new preference among young people, single people, empty nesters would be for the urban center. I think the next phase has to be inclusive because we, this divided thing doesn't work. And it's not just about, you know, you could, you could hear some people, not, I'm not saying in Philadelphia's business community, saying, well, we need to protect the investments. We need to make sure that talented people want to live here. We need to make sure that the middle class feels safe in our city. We need to make sure that the, the, the restaurateurs don't leave. Well, that's not necessary, but not sufficient. We need to make sure everyone feels like, and, and with this wave of unrest, it's very interesting. It's different than the one I grew up with. In Newark, it was unrest that targeted neighborhood-based businesses. This unrest very pointedly has targeted luxury stores. And you look at the carnage in Soho, it's, it's all the big brand luxury stores as if people are saying, that's not my city. That, that's a city for not even, not, not even wealthy people who live here. That's a city for tourists and, and people who are coming in from all over the world to go shopping in my neighborhood. So I think it's quite apparent to people how unequal our cities have become and, and, and really, I, the, the argument I would like to make to business people and, to, you know, and, and actually to universities, you know, if you, if you asked me to be quite candid, what group of people are most threatened, if you will, most institutions, large institutions are most threatened by this, by the COVID pandemic and the economic and, 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 and civic fallout, it's urban universities. I mean, uh, how do you continue to attract faculty? How do you continue to tell mom and dad to fork over 50, 60, 70 grand. I mean, that happened in the 60s. People for, you know, didn't go back to urban universities. So I think that the anchor institutions have to really digest the fact that their future and the city's future turns on a joint agenda for a more inclusive and a resilient city. I'm curious if both of you could talk even about some more specific things that you think need to change. Just one or two things that are very specific in terms of we, we can't really move forward unless X, Y, or Z actually changes. Council, I'll go first. A, li a living wage, a living wage for every Philadelphian, um, a living wage tied to local living conditions. Uh, and, and if we have half of Philadelphia's workforce made up of frontline service workers uh, who, who have a pittance left over after paying for housing, we have to make them a middle class. And the way I praise that is my dad went to work in a factory at age 13 and it took nine people in his family to make a living wage. He came back from his service in World War II, went back to work in the same factory in Newark, New Jersey and had a good job, had a family supporting wage. We decided in the 1930s and 40s that men, largely white men, uh, des deserved a family supporting wage. And so we paid more for cars and television sets and refrigerators, whatever, we could, radios. We can pay more. I mean, my 20% tip on Instacart is a token jester. We can pay more to get stuff delivered. We can pay more for people to work in grocery stores. We can pay more for people to take care of our kids and aging parents. And it, it's not gonna take a lot of sacrifice to create a middle class out of that 50, think about that. 50% of Philadelphia's workforce is comprised of low wage contingent, uh, largely black, minority, and immigrant frontline workers. That's job one. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the issue, and as a city, we've tried, obviously, the state regulates minimum wage, but it doesn't stop the, to your point, the eds and meds and people saying, we're all going to get to 15, right? This is a conversation I've had with the Greater Chamber of Commerce. When we talk about benefits for the city, I said most of their workers are eligible for some of these federal benefits because their salaries are low. So it's like, 
Can you make a pledge that over the next couple of years, you're going to do that? As it relates to housing and, and, and access to, to adequate housing, I think the city has to put everything on the table, mixed income housing. I've been a proponent of it. Wanted to do it mandatory, couldn't get the 12 votes uh, to override it. Looking at transit-oriented development, really explaining uh, quality between you know, density, transportation center, and then open green spaces. And I think what happens when we talk about all of these we separate them for folks as opposed to saying, this is what makes a good neighborhood. I live in Norris Square in South Kensington, right? And Norris Square could either be a mixed income uh, community or it's going to be a displacement community and, and I'm going to feel the tensions of Point Breeze. And I'm constantly juggling that and we're working on some public-private partnerships because, again, we can't put the community development organizations to compete against the private sector. It's like, how do you collaborate? How do we do partnerships? And that's what I've been working towards because I actually believe that is a key component. This people feeling displaced um, and we do it through public policy, right? If we want to continue abatements because it's necessary, then you can't pass off unrealized value to long income residents, right? It's sort of like the city is, is hungry to capture the value, right? So you pass it on onto the long-term folks. So we, if we're saying all of these things, then our policies can't conflict with the messaging. And I think that's what we've lost in the city uh, of Philadelphia. We use real estate, a broken real estate appraisal system to push people out of neighborhoods. And then, you know, we cashed in on it, but we're willing to deal with the root uh, causes and business taxes. I mean, the fact that we're one of those jurisdictions with our multinationals, that anger towards the multi multinationals is because they don't pay taxes in the city of Philadelphia and everybody knows it. And it's sort of like, we got to stop covering that and really say, what does it cost to be in the market? How do we make this fair? You know, when I looked at small businesses, the manufacturing sector, we still have openings in the manufacturing sector. We have a huge skills gap around how do we connect people to those neighborhood jobs? Um, again, we, we know what it takes. It's like, who's going to do this? And to Richard's point, all of us should feel a responsibility to do it. And then leadership has to provide a mechanism by which people are investing in it. Yeah, I couple, just agree 100%. A couple of things we touched on in our report on a more inclusive Philadelphia. One is we can see the power of anchor institutions like the universities and medical centers when they invest in their neighborhood. Um, it's worth considering the creation of mini anchors or anchor-like institutions in less advantaged neighborhoods. In some cases, some of those institutions are already in those neighborhoods and maybe neglecting them. In other cases, they draw employees from those neighborhoods. And in other cases, there's arts and cultural organizations or nonprofits or neighborhood organizations that can be bolstered. Uh, the second thing, of course, is a longer run issue for Philadelphia and all of our cities is our educational systems. And I just, I don't want to impugn this. I mean, I've heard this from everyone I've talked to in Philadelphia. I just want to contrast this with my day-to-day -day life in Toronto. I live in a neighborhood of single family homes less than a mile from the downtown urban center and within a half a mile of pretty impacted poverty communities uh, with what we call social housing here in, in Toronto. Um, but this community certainly did not explode or implode. And the reason is that we have a provincially funded education system or state funded education system, which means almost all of us have relatively equal education, not completely equal, mm -hmm. but much more relatively equal educational opportunities to the extent that if you got into a car share or an Uber here when you could, and you talk to a new immigrant Canadian, a new Canadian, they would tell you that their children go to premier universities, the University of Toronto where I teach, is mainly a commuter school. It has elite people coming from all over, but it takes up 90,000 students. 90,000 students in a city of 3 million uh, can go to the University of Toronto, many of them from new immigrant communities, visible, what we call visible minorities. And of course, we have a healthcare system that is provincially funded, um, which means every Torontonian has access to healthcare. Now, it's not the concierge system that you have in Philadelphia, where if you have money, you get your private doctor and I have to go wait in the line. And sometimes I don't like it. But when you look at the overall effect of that social safety net, of an education system that's much, not perfect, but much fairer, and we have our issues with racism and structural poverty here too, it just shows you that another way is possible. And, and I would hope, you know, I mean, this is not a Philadelphia issue per se, but we are going to have an election in November. It looks like we may be able to get a new president 
Now that still gives us six or seven months of not a great time, but to prevail upon the Democratic Party and its nominee, that we not only need a stimulus plan and an infrastructure investment like we did last time, that we need a real urban policy in this country. And I think that message is getting through. But, you know, to talk with our friends in Congress, in the Senate, uh, other mayors, other councilors, to really build a robust urban agenda for real recovery, I think the time to do that is now, and it should be mayor and council-led. It can't just come from the National Democratic Party. It's got to come from below this time. And, and I think a big plank, you said this, Councilwoman, I'd love to get your reaction. The city is hamstrung from a revenue point of view, mm -hmm. uh, and it's making cuts that are unattractive and probably not the best. Well, cities like Philadelphia pay a lot of money to the, your residents pay a lot of money to the federal government that the federal government then redistributes. What if we had a new deal between Philadelphia and our cities and the federal government where not just power but revenue was devolved to the city to address its own challenges and opportunities? I think the Democrats, that's something they could really think hard. They did it in the New Deal. Franklin Roosevelt forged a new deal between cities and the feds. We could expand that and create a way to devolve power and empower local actors, community activists, city leaders, councillors, mayors, uh, to do more to address their city's opportunities and challenges. So I think there's an opportunity now, but we've, we've got to really go full out to grab it. And I think to that point is, again, getting to inclusive and equity means acknowledging the gaps that exist, right? Because you can't get to an even playing field if you're not filling in the structural gaps that that exist. <clears throat> I think the Democratic Party and, you know, Vice President Biden chose election day to come to Philly, um, post all of the stuff that's going on to send a message. And he did make some commitments to cities, right? We depend on the federal government and the state government, but state government, um, even under a Democratic governor, has somewhat been hostile to cities like Philadelphia. And in Harrisburg, it's anything um, uh, that's not for Philadelphia. And so we have we have some challenges. We're trying to bridge those gaps locally because we understand we have a responsibility around that messaging. But the Democratic Party um, really needs to not be about business as usual. And I hope that they're listening um, and they're looking at this COVID uh, situation. They're looking at the last couple of weeks. They're looking at the tension and the frustration and that they step up to it, right? I'm part of this party even though I never get supported because I'm too independent and I call them out, you know, it is people like me, voices like minds of lived experience, right? I'm a policy person, I'm a numbers person, but no one can tell me how hard it is because I've lived in public housing, you know, I was a lead baby, um, you know, I was a single mother. Like this, there are people who don't need a handout, they need a hand up, they need government to, to, to level out the playing field, and they will step up to the plate. And you got to believe in that. And I think the Democrats have lost that, that, that notion of what it's founded for, which was we believe in people and that people um, can, can um, thrive. And we see that with children in the education system. I think the new normal of poorly funded schools, when you look at Philadelphia, I'm now the new chair of education, in, in the, the budget discussions is like, what are the guardrails? You know, they did an, an analysis and the school district of, of Philadelphia and the board of education was spending less than like 20% of their time talking about educational achievements. They spent 80% of their time talking building and other stuff. That is a problem because pe the children will not rise to the occasion when the adults are fighting around all the nuances and no one's talking about academic achievement. I think you're both raising interesting points that, that Philadelphia does not obviously operate in a vacuum, that what happens on the national stage and nationally when it comes to national culture is, is important here. And I'm curious whether you're seeing anything, in, in I think the twin crises that we're, we're living through now, that anything is about to change along those lines. Are we forever you know, destined to just be pitted at each other and that we're never going to make any progress on these issues? Well, you know, I'm, I'm 62 years old. So I've watched the progress on urban issues occur during the great Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration and the great energy. And it's almost as if we take one step forward under a Democrat and then two steps back. Um, and so I've watched the federal urban agenda erode. Worse for cities, as the Congress, as the council person said, um, our states are arrayed against us because we live in a highly polarized society where where we live is a key element if we live in a rural area suburban area versus an urban area density i mean once a place crosses about 800 people a mile it turns from red to blue 
And so it's a key determinant of our political outlook, whether we drive a car to work, whether we use transit, whether we live in a dense neighborhood. So the problem is we live in a highly polarized society. So I'm not sure we're gonna get national consensus. What we could do, do though, I think is get a consensus, a, a rough bipartisan consensus around devolution. Where if, if I want to live in a city like Philadelphia, I can keep a lot of my revenue and program my revenue the way that I'd like. Whereas if I want to live in a, in a red state or in a, in a more suburban community, I can live my way. In the United States, people often say the most powerful vote we have is to vote with our feet. And so I think we have to realize that there are different points of view, but if we want cities to succeed, I think it's not going to be a general federal program because I don't think we can get consensus on it. I think it will be a devolution that says all communities in America can keep more of what they have and use it to address their needs. Um, I just don't see us coalescing. By the way, I think we're, we're in a low ad. Look, I mean, the fact that we have such a, a, a president who's not only not unfit for office, but so divisive, I, I, it's unimaginable this, this can continue. Um, so my hope is by next year, we're on a heel, we're on the mend, but that we have to keep our nose to the, we can't let this up. We have to keep our nose to the grindstone. And, and from the Democrats' point of view, it can't just be one step forward and then two steps back. Maybe we got to take three steps forward. Council member, what about the national conversation? Do you see any signs for hope there? Well, again, I, I'm in politics and the business of politics, and I believe that we, we can move the conversation. One of the things is, as someone who considers herself you know, very, very progressive, I've come into a body and an institution where I also understand that it's not just about, about being right. I don't have a district where I have the luxury of just giving good speeches. I got to deliver every single day. And I think if we can listen to each other a little bit more about what people care about, you know, uh, one of the things I've learned in council in, in, in the process of legislating is if you take a minute and you listen to folks, there's some connectivity about what's important to that person and what's important to me. And it's sort of like, how do you connect those so that they understand your issue? And, and I've been very successful in council because of that. And I think that's what we need in Harrisburg. We need a little bit more of a dialogue of people kind of listening to each other. What happens in, in, the, in rural uh, parts of, of Pennsylvania as it relates to education, and now as it relates to unemployment, all of those, how do we use those challenges to have a conversation about why it's better when everyone's better, right? And that takes a little bit of time and it takes more than just rhetoric, right? There's a lot of grandstanding, the work around listening to each other and creating the pathways to, to a win-win are much harder. And I think we, we've lost that in politics. We've lost it with Trump, right? Because you can't have a same conversation. We're not even in the same wavelength. But that he cannot dominate the stage. I think in Congress, um, I think through some of, you know, you saw this through some of the PPE, you know, the, the PPP funding, the business funding, there are things that are important to people that are important um, to us too. And, and again, we can't, we can't find the villain to promote the cause. The cause is all of us. And so I think post-Trump, there's a lot of healing to do, but there's also a lot of maturing to do about the types of conversations we want to have when we disagree, right? When we agree, we can be res be respectful. When we disagree, we should even be more so, right? Because you're not going to change people's minds, but you got to get them to understand your perspective. And we've lost that in, in the political dialogue. And just to build on that um, and why I think devolution and local empowerment is so critical. If you look at surveys of the American population, um, and you not only take liberals and conservatives, you take the most extreme people on the left and the most extreme people on the right who are completely polarized on national level. Mm -hmm. When you get to local issues, that polarization goes away, say for one issue, gun control. Mm -hmm. There is, but, but on almost every issue, mm -hmm. there's almost a consensus and, and the division is very small. And, and you, you see it if you just walk around Philadelphia. If you go out to the suburbs of Philadelphia and, and you talk to people, they're proud of Philadelphia. They're proud of the center city. They're proud of the restaurants. They're proud of the revival. They're proud of the great university. They're not saying like, run the city down, we're better off. It's not the rhetoric of national level politicians. You do the same thing in Detroit. You go, my, my wife's family is from Detroit. You go out to the Detroit suburbs and you talk to dyed in the wool Republican, sorry. Uh, and, and they're so proud of what's happened in downtown Detroit. It, it makes them, their hearts sing. 
And so I think that everyone can be on the same page when it comes to their community. It's when this thing gets magnified into a national level debate that, that things break down. And by the way, you know, one thing that, that, that probably worth us talking about is policing. You know, before we, we, we end this, I was very proud of my hometown of Newark, uh, which was at the edge of police brutality in the 1960s, but which through a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of hard thinking and doing, the police have become more of a partner in understanding civil disobedience than a, than a fueler of protest and outrage. I think, you know, we can think a lot about other mechanisms that make our cities more effective than police power. Uh, Pat Sharkey, a professor now at Princeton, formerly of NYU, talks about the neighborhood fabric, community organization, nonprofit institutions, strengthening those fibers, and how those are the keys to making communities safer, not police power. And I think hopefully as we begin to heal, we can take, you know, not, not, there's class injustice, there's racial institution, there's structural racism, but, but finally figuring out that police force is not the solution, but a new way of really thinking about a more cohesive community and seeing the police as, and I, I will say in Toronto, you never, it, it's so interesting. And I don't mean to, this isn't painting the picture of a shining city on the hill. You seldom hear a siren. You seldom see police present. You seldom see uniformed officers with a gun drawn. They are trained to de-escalate and to be invisible. And I think that's something our cities can learn, that, that, that policing and social cohesion can be done differently. And, and, and hopefully Philadelphia can help lead that. Absolutely. But the police, in at least in districts like mine, I have um, become a, an incredible ally in understanding the realities of what their jobs are. But, you know, under um, Ramsey, we had the feds come in, the Justice Department came in, it issued 150 recommendations, the police oversight board was formed. I was a member of that board for a couple of years, and we looked at everything from use of force, de-escalation, new training, all of those things. The first thing Kenny did when he got into office was he dismantled that. And we had community members on that board who were having the tough conversations. So it really pins as, you know, as someone who has a lot of friends who are in the police force who join it because they believe in the community engagement component of it. For them, this is very sad too, right? They entered a, a business because they love their community. And I see it every single day. But when you have an institution that the feds have identified that has some structural issues, we have some core issues, some things that our arbitration, you know, our the you know the lack of of our ability to hold folks accountable. Um, that's not good for the police officers, and it's not good for us as a, uh, as a city. And and we've not done what we should have been doing over the last three or four years as it relates to that. Um, and I will say that I mean, and that's why you see the hostility that you see. And and again, in districts like mine, people want to see police presence. They want to see a different kind of presence. And we've worked hard at that. But it that's not the, the the norm in the city and it's not how people feel and ultimately we can say whatever we want but if people don't feel it right if they don't believe it um then you know we're just spinning our wheels great i think we're going to have to end there thank you both for your time maria canonez sanchez richard florida we appreciate your time and your insights on these important issues Thanks for our audience for tuning in. And I invite our audience to tune in for the rest of this week to some of the other sessions that we have coming up on ThinkFest 2020. Thanks very much. Thank you so very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you.